Why won't they buy from us? Well, maybe they won't buy from us because they don't know who we are. What we're going to do is we're going to practice this combination of marketing best practices and behavioral science that will increase the likelihood that um, our clients get the response they're looking for, that they're the prospects and customers of our clients do what our clients want them to do. Today, I'm very excited to be joined by Nancy Harhud. If you don't know who Nancy is, she's the co-founder and chief creative officer at HBT Marketing an agency that helps marketers increase their engagement with their messaging. She's also the author of Using Behavioral Science in Marketing, Drive Customer Action and Loyalty by Prompting Instinctive Responses. I went really slow because I wanted to get that right. Nancy, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? I'm doing really well. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super stoked that you're here with us today. Today, Nancy and I are going to explore behavioral science and we're going to explore some tips that help us become better marketers and get better results. Now, before we go there, Nancy, I would love to hear your story. How did you get into behavioral science and marketing? Start wherever you want to start. So, you know, it's a good question, Michael. And um, as I think about it, I, I might have gotten my start because I had an incredibly overprotective mother. Okay, Mm -hmm. so that means that no matter what I wanted to do, just to keep up with my friends, whether it was to, you know, go to somebody's, you know, house to go swimming or go to a party or stay out to, you know, God forbid, 10 o'clock at night, you know, whatever it was, I had to mount a case to convince my mother that it would be okay. I had to figure out, you know, what was she going to object to and what could I possibly say that might change her mind? You know, like, oh, well, you know, Mrs. Hunt will be there to watch us in the pool or everybody's parents said they can go to the party, you know, whatever it was. Like, I had to like really think it through just so I could keep up with my friends. And, you know, fast forward to me, you know, applying to college and I'm writing my essay. And I remember writing something that's, you know, now that I think about it, it's kind of pretentious, but I, I wrote something like, uh, you know, I, I like to dabble in the art of persuasion, please. Right. But, you know, but even then I was like, I was fascinated by what persuades people and how to convince them. And so now I enter the work world and I'm working at an agency, kind of working my way up. And somehow I find this book called, um, Influenced the Psychology of Persuasion by Robert Cialdini. And I'm loving Love it. Love that I'm book. Like, I studied like, that in college too. Yeah. Isn't it phenomenal? So yeah. I'm like underlining and writing margin notes. And I'm thinking, Michael, about all of the client work that I'm doing. So at this point, I'm a, you know, probably a creative director, but I'm still writing copy. And, you know, I'm like, oh, I could use that to help sell, you know, newspaper subscriptions. Maybe I could use that to help sell uh, credit card uh, memberships, you know, and I'm just thinking about these things and I start to apply them and it seems to be working pretty well. But then I switch agencies and, um, I joined this agency right at a time when one of their clients was, you know, a little dissatisfied. And so the the agency was thinking, we better, you know, kind of up our game because we might end up in a review if we don't. So, you know, they hired me and they're like, oh, we've got this new creative director and we're going to, we're going to do a test. We're going to take the, you know, the control, the, you know, the piece that you've been using, the asset that you've been using, that's been doing the best so far. And we're going to put it up against this new thing that, that Nancy's written. And this was the first time that I could actually do a head to head test because until then I was, you know, I was grabbing what I could from the literature and I was figuring out how I thought it would work and I'd put it in and it seemed to be doing well, but there was no, you know, head to head, AB split kind of a test. So we, you know, we put the two pieces in the market, we get a 459% lift over the control. And wow. in this particular case, we were selling, buckle your seatbelts, we were selling insurance to dentists. I know, I'm about to lose every one of your listeners, but no, 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 really, <laughs> we're not going to go deep on this. But we literally, we were, we were selling insurance to dentists, two, you know, kind of boring topics, if you will, but we were literally getting them to buy. We weren't generating leads or inquiries or interest. We were getting them to buy 459% lift over the previous longstanding best piece that they had. And that was when I realized I'm onto something. This whole idea of using behavioral science and marketing, you know, it, it confirmed my hunch that this really, really worked, that you could be, a, you know, a, a master of the best practices for uh, for marketing, you know, regardless of the discipline. It could be email or landing pages or social media or, or you know, a DRTV, whatever it is. Um, but if you overlaid on those best practices, this idea of behavioral science, it was going to give you that that one-two punch that was just going to increase the likelihood that people would do what you wanted them to do. And, you know, once I had that kind of empirical evidence, that proof that, uh, you know, that this really did work and it wasn't just my hunch, but I knew what I was doing, I never looked back. I, I started to, you know, talk about it with my clients. I started to use it with my clients. And then, you know, a couple of years ago, uh, Kogan Page, the London-based uh, publisher that published my book, said, hey, how about writing a book? And 
here we are using behavioral science and marketing, right? So we've, we've kind of come full circle, but, uh, but that was how I got started. And I, as I think about it, I trace it all the way back to, you know, God rest her soul, my overprotective mother. She fueled in me that, that love of, of persuasion and convincing people and just trying to figure out why people do what they do and, and how to get them to do what you want. Very cool. Um, when did you decide to go off and start your own agency? Tell us a little bit about that story and maybe bring us up to the present as far as what you're doing for your clients. Sure. So, you know, it, it, um, it, it wasn't this incredible founder story, to be very honest with you. I'd been very comfortable working in different agencies and, you know, very happy doing what I do and doing what I do well and letting everyone else do the other stuff that I don't know a lot about. Right. But um, I ended up uh, working the last agency I worked at. I'd end up closing. They just, they ended up shutting it down and they went in a different direction and all of us were without jobs. And mm-hmm. I was a woman of a certain age without a job. And uh, so I just thought, okay, I'll find another agency because that's where I'm most comfortable. And, you know, periodically people had said, when are you going to hang out your own shingle? When are you going to hang out your own shingle? And I've had, ah, you know, I'm just very happy, you know, letting some, you know, working for someone else's, uh, you know, under, under someone else's shingle. But uh, at this point I was a little bit older and um, the guy who had been the president of the agency really talked me into it. You know, it was like, Nancy, we have something here that people really like, you know, this, this last, uh, you know, several years, this last five, six, seven years, whatever it was that we've been working together, um, you know, at this agency where we sold the insurance to the dentist, you know, the whole thing using behavioral science, um, you know, we've grown this agency tremendously. There is a market for, for what we do. And, you know, let's, let's, let's give it a whirl. And I got to tell you, Michael, nobody was really beating a path to my door saying, hire me or, or, or come work for me, come work for me. So I said, all right, we're going to do it. And uh, so I co-founded HBT Marketing. The HBT stands for Human Behavior Triggers. Mm. And, we, you know, we kind of put a stake in the ground and said, what we're going to do is we're going to practice this combination of marketing best practices and behavioral science that will increase the likelihood that, um, our clients get the response they're looking for, that they're the prospects and customers of our clients do what our clients want them to do. And it's been a great ride so far. It's been, I think we're coming up on six years and still going strong. And uh, we've got the book out now, which is great. But uh, but even without the book, we're, you know, we're still doing really well. The, the book is great because honestly, you know, we're a, we're a boutique agency. We, we can take on a certain number of clients. We're always, you know, always happy to talk to clients, but realistically, we can't work for everybody. And now this means that people can tap into the book and they can find out what's been working. It's 288 pages, 17 chapters, and over 25 different behavioral science principles. And they're my go-to principles because there are honestly hundreds of them. But these 25 are the ones that I have found worked over and over and over again for my clients. So it's kind of a, you know, a, a hands-on handbook for people who are you know, marketers or who have found that marketing is now on their to-do list. Maybe they've got a bunch of other things to do as well, but, um, but it's just a great resource for people to go to to get very practical, actionable, proven tactics that they can start to use in their marketing to prompt those responses, to prompt that engagement. Very cool. Well, those that have been avid listeners to the show know I've had Robert Cialdini on the show twice. And it's been a real pleasure to have him on the show. Um, and I love all the stuff and all the all the amalgamation of research and stuff that he's done over his career. Now, um, there are plenty of marketers listening right now that do not really understand why behavioral science is so important. They might be able to understand from your story about the idea of doing like uh, split tests and and seeing an uplift with experimenting with ideas and stuff like that. But maybe they just don't in their head, rationalize why behavioral science is so important. So what do you want to say to those marketers that are maybe skeptical about the concept of behavioral science? What is it about this that could be an unlock for them? Yeah, you know, that that's a great question. And it actually reminds me that I should step back and just kind of level set and say, you know, when I talk about behavioral science, what I'm talking about very s- simply is the study of how people behave or more specifically, why they do what they do. And behavioral scientists have found that you know, people don't make decisions the way we marketers think they do. They don't make these well thought out, well considered decisions. You know, you and I think that we make decisions that way. And by extension, we think that our customers and prospects do. And you know what? Truthfully, sometimes we do, but very often, very often we don't. We're, we're kind of cruising along on autopilot. And what we do is we we rely on decision defaults. Over the ages, humans have developed certain automatic, instinctive, reflexive responses. Uh, and we've, we've done this as a way to conserve mental energy. And so as a result, we have these hardwired behaviors. We cruise along on autopilot. We encounter a certain situation. And we just default to these hardwired behaviors, giving them little, if any, thought. So what this means for marketers is if we can get out ahead of that, if we know that people are prone to just doing certain things, they're going to do X if they see Y. 
that, you know, they're going to do, uh, you know, they're going to choose the middle option. And if, if you put three things in front of them, that gives us an edge. Uh, you know, for example, I talked about the, you know, I'm going to return for just a moment to the dentist and the insurance. But what we ended up doing there is um, we use something that Dr. Cialdini, who was gracious enough to endorse my book, actually, we use something that Dr. Cialdini calls the pull of the magnetic middle. And what he found was that, generally speaking, people don't like to be out on the bleeding edge and they don't like to be lagging behind. That doesn't feel right either. Where people feel most comfortable is in the center where most people are. It, it just feels like there's safety in numbers. We feel comfortable in the center. So when we were trying to get these dentists to buy more insurance, what we did is we, we put this graph in our messaging. And at one end of the graph, it was $0, least amount of insurance you could have. And at the other end, it was $3 million, the most this particular company sold. And then we put a little marker that said, you are here. And it was personalized to each target. But we were careful to choose targets that had uh, less than 100, uh, less than 1.5 million of, of insurance, right? So they would be left of center in all cases. And there were quite a few, right? There were a lot of them that were that were left of center. But what happens is you, you know, you get the message, you look at that that graph before you read a word, right? You look at that graph and you have this feeling right away where you're like, oh, I'm I'm left of center. I'm I'm lagging behind. I'm not where I should be. And we didn't expect that that would make everyone rush and, you know, buy a full three million, but we did think it would move them closer to that 1.5 million mark or maybe a little bit over it. And that's exactly what it did. So the beauty of behavioral science is uh, for from a marketing perspective, is that we can trigger these hardwired automatic behaviors that, that humans have, these decision-making shortcuts that they rely on, that, that we all rely on, in order to increase the likelihood that people will do what we want them to do. And there's no magic wand. There's no silver bullet. I can't make you do something you don't want to do. But very often, you know, people are kind of on the cusp. They may do it. They may not. They may go with you. They may go with a competitor. And so being able to overlay your marketing best practices with the behavioral science gives you that added advantage or that secret sauce, whatever you want to call it, that makes it more likely that people will do what you want them to do. It's just tapping into this hardwired human behavior that we have. So as long as we know what science has proven about uh, human behavior, we might as well use it to influence and get the human behavior that we're looking for. Right now, I'm envisioning the listening audience completely locked into everything you just said. And they're all, yes, this sounds fascinating. I absolutely want to learn more about where do I start, right? Where do I even begin, uh, Nancy? That's my question to you. Where do I even begin when it comes to this behavioral science stuff? So, you know, what you want to do is, you know, you want to think about the marketing challenge that you have, right? So you've got this product or the service, you've got this target market. So you want to think about your target market and a lot of times marketers think, why should my target buy what I'm offering? Why should they buy this product? Why should they buy this service? And that's a good question to ask. But what we should also be asking is, why won't they? You know, mm -hmm. what's going to stop them from doing it? And that's what we want to dive into. We want to think about, okay, I want you to do this. Why are you going to be hesitant? Why might you not want to do what I ask you to do? And then what we do is we turn to behavioral science and we start to look at the available principles and tactics and, and practices. And we start to say, okay, what might work? So uh, if, if we're, maybe we're a company and we're expanding into a new geography where we're not particularly known. So, you know, we've got this great product, but nobody really knows us. So why won't they buy from us? Well, maybe they won't buy from us because they don't know who we are. So what can we do in that case? Well, maybe we can tap into, uh, you know, social proof. Maybe we can talk about how many satisfied customers we have. Maybe we can run some testimonials, you know. Uh, you know, maybe we can talk about who's endorsed us. And it's like we can look at different ways that we can pull in behavioral science to overcome that buying barrier. So in that particular case, it was, you know, perhaps using social proof, but, you know, maybe there are other things we can do. Uh, behavioral scientists, for example, have found that people are more likely to do what we ask them to do if we give them a reason why. So well, we've maybe we've moved into this new territory. People don't know us. We want them to buy. So maybe we, you know, it's not enough to just say we've got this great product at this great price and here's where you can find it. Maybe we need to close the loop and say, here's why you should be interested, you know, mm -hmm. check us out because this will give you a, you know, a, a lead over your competition. You know, check us out because this will save, you know, two hours out of every working day, you know, whatever it is. Um, and in fact, that in both of those examples, I use the word because, and that's actually a very powerful word. Behavioral scientists refer to it as a automatic compliance trigger. When we see or hear the word because, we often just start nodding like, like little bobbleheads, really. We, we start to agree before we've even processed what comes after the word because. Mm -hmm. We just assume whatever's coming after it, it's going to be a good, legitimate, 
reason. And we hear, you know, you'd be interested in this, Michael, because, and already you're starting to nod. Yeah. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah. You know, you're ready to agree with me, even though you haven't processed what comes next. That is tricky. I did find myself nodding, even though you said it. It's so weird for those that are watching the video. So hold on a second. Um, because um, I want to dive in on this a little bit. Um, you know, when we're using the written word, the word because doesn't feel as natural as when we're speaking. You know what I mean? Like, I want to share with you that there is a problem that I can help you solve because, I mean, I don't know if it feels the word, is it the word because, or is it other synonyms that we can also use? Because I've heard, like, for example, Brian Clark from Copy Blogger claim that you and because are the two most powerful words, uh, persuasive words in the English language. And I tend to agree with the word you, but I want to understand whether we have to use the word because or whether we can use similar um, similar phrases. I'm just curious what your thoughts are on that word. Yeah. So there's a little bit, you, you've uncovered a little bit of a nuance there, which is great. So, so the, the prevailing behavioral science thinking is uh, people are more likely to do what you ask them to do if you give them a reason why. And then some research came out of Harvard, a uh, researcher named uh, Ellen Langer, and she's the one who identified the word because as an automatic compliance trigger. So, so it's almost like there's, you know, two related things. You want to provide the reason why and a great way to tee up that reason why is to use the word because. But the truth of the matter is, even if you're comfortable, you know, saying a lot or writing it a lot, you know, you don't want every other, you know, sentence to begin the same way. You don't want to start every paragraph the same way. So there are uh, synonyms that you can use. The idea really is to just provide that reason why, you know, the reason is or since or therefore or as a yeah. result or so. Or, or here's know? why you might want to consider it, something along those lines, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's really just providing that reason why. And and certainly sometimes use the word because when it feels comfortable, when you haven't overused it, but but having that reason why can really get people to, um, you know, to do what we're asking them to do. Okay, so so far we talked about when we start, we want to think about who that audience is. We want to talk about um, why they would purchase your product or service, why they would not purchase your product or service. Apply some behavioral science, which we're going to get into a little bit more later, but you mentioned social proof, which is like quotes and testimonials from third parties. Um, give them a reason why. What about mindset? Is mindset, I know when we were prepping for this, the word mindset came up in this question. I don't know if we have to have a certain mindset or we have to think about the mindset of the recipient that we're targeting. Anything particularly on mindset related to um, how to get started? Sure. I think um, a lot of it involves um, anticipating what the mindset of our prospective customer is. Huh. You know, they might be... Um, you know, they might be particularly frugal. They might be risk averse. They might be of the opinion that, uh, you know, all products in this category are basically the same. Uh, you know, they might be, maybe we're selling um, uh, retirement services. One of my clients tries to get people to save for retirement, you know, in, in 401k programs and things like that. And very often, you know, the mindset that we encounter is, yes, you know, the prospective customer says, I, I think it's a great idea. I know I should be saving for retirement. It's just that I don't have time right now. I'll mm -hmm. do it later. I have time later, but right now I, you know, I, I just, I have too many other competing financial uh, obligations, you know? And so understanding that that's their mindset helps us craft the right argument, the right message to help overcome it. So it's really, I think, thinking about, um, you know, why somebody might buy, why they might not buy, you know, what's their mindset, you know, typically as it relates to why they might not buy. And then what's the best thing we can say that that might, um, you know, disavow them of, of that notion and get them to say, oh, maybe I should be doing this now. Maybe I should listen. Maybe I should give it a chance. Outstanding. Okay. We're going to dive deep into some um, behavioral science principles um, what's the first principle that, uh, you would love to share with us and we'll explain, you know, what it is, why it works and maybe give some examples. Uh, sure. I, well, how about, why don't we start with the authority principle? Um, okay. as a matter of fact, you know, that, that's another thing we could bring to bear if we're this, you know, company that's expanding into a new geography and, you know, people don't know who we are. So I said, you know, one thing we could do is we could test some social proof. Okay. You don't know who we are, but here's all these customers who have similar needs to yours and they really like us. But another thing we could do is we could tap into uh, the authority principle. And uh, the way that works is um, behavioral scientists have found that ever since we were kids, we've been taught to recognize and respect authority. So by the time we're adults, it's, it's ingrained in us. And if authority says something to us, we often believe it. And if an authority asks us to do something, we, we generally comply, we generally do it. And uh, so what this means is marketers have a, you know, an opportunity here to point to authorities, to subject matter experts, to outside or independent experts, because, you know, a lot of times somebody may 
question what we as marketers say. You know, we say our product is good and they think, well, okay, you better think it's good at your product, you know, or they think, of course you say it's good at your product. But when an outside expert comes along and says it's good, you know, that's, that carries a little bit more uh, credence, a little bit more believability. You know, if I were looking for a, a ski park uh, and I found um, that the U.S. ski team says that uh, L.L. Bean ski parkas are, you know, you know, trusted by them, I might say to myself, I don't have to look anymore. You know, the U.S. ski team knows far more about ski parkas than I'll ever know. And if they think that these are great, then they're great. You know, I can make my purchase. I can feel confident and I can go about the rest of my day without, you know, having to be bogged down with doing more research and comparison shopping. So we have a tendency to, um, you know, to to listen to what authorities say. There was actually. Um, oh, real, if, yeah, real quick, real quick question. Um, sure. Well, a thought. Toothpaste. Right, these toothpaste um, claims where they say the American Dental Association, 99% of the American Dental Association recommends you use this toothpaste, right? Isn't that an example of what we're talking about? And I also think of these commercials where they show guys in lab coats and stuff like that. Is this also potentially the authority principle at work or no? Oh, absolutely. You, you, you've you got it head on. You hit it head on. Um, you know, you had the, you know, recommended by the ADA or we're a member of the, the BBB, the Better Business Bureau, or... Um, you know, I was featured in Fortune magazine or, right. uh, you know, the American Marketing Association endorses us or Consumer right. Reports or, you know, Good right. Housekeeping, whatever. Yeah. And then the the lab coat, that's a that's a great example. I was going to say to you, there was an interesting example of um, the authority uh, principle kind of in the wild, if you will. So this wasn't like a, uh, a, a research study or, or, you know, something that the scientists devised. But uh, what happened was there were a couple of guys in – Oregon. And I say a couple of guys, they were criminals, right? they were crooks. What oh. they did is they they dressed up as bank guards and they positioned themselves in front of a Wells, Tar uh, Wells Fargo ATM, put a sign on the ATM that said, the ATM is broken. Please give your deposit, your money, right? Please give your deposits to the guards. And then they just stood there in their bank guard garb, right? And people came in, they read the sign and most, most, most people didn't even say a word. They just read the sign and handed the money over to the guards. And these, these crooks made off with thousands of dollars. Now, if you or I had been standing there, you know, and put up a sign that said, you know, oh, the ATM's not, you know, not working, but you know, Michael will take your money to the bank or Nancy will take your money to the bank. Nobody would be handing their money to us, right? But these guys look like bank guards, you know? And so the same thing you're saying, you know, if someone's wearing a, a white coat, if I, if I um, create a social post for um, some kind of health insurance and I happen to have a image of somebody in a white jacket with a stethoscope around their neck and I don't identify them as a doctor and I don't identify them, you know, as, by their name or by their position, but the image is just there. It's just going to suggest that my healthcare insurance, my healthcare product is better because there's a picture of an authority there, you know? Now, I'm not necessarily recommending we do that. I think it's much better if you have a name and an actual person who's willing to endorse you. But, you know, the, the difference of, you know, having that person in a white coat or not, you know, in fact, there was a, there was a study that uh, Robert Cialdini talks about um, that involved jaywalking. So walking against the light, which is illegal, right? You're not supposed to jaywalk, kind of cut across two intersections, but, but people do it. And so they, they set up this experiment where there was a guy dressed in a nice suit and some days he would be dressed in his nice suit and he would jaywalk. And other days he would be dressed in uh, like a work shirt and work pants and he would jaywalk. And they watched to see how many people would follow him. And it turned out that there was a 350% increase in the number of people who followed him when he was dressed in a business suit. Now, when you think about it, okay, he's dressed in a business suit, but that doesn't make him a expert on traffic patterns or, you know, or, or when it's safe to cross the street. And, and frankly, he was, he was breaking the law by doing it. And yet so many more people were willing to follow him when he was dressed in a business suit versus, you know, work shirt and, and uh, work pants. So it's just, you know, clothes can actually convey authority, just like, you know, the good housekeeping seal of approval can convey it. Or, you know, um, I, I've, got, I've got a bunch of, you know, books and photos in, in my back, you know, my background that says something, but if they were comic books, maybe it would say something else. If they were leather bound law books, it would say yet something else, you know? So the different props that you have, um, a funny story. I was in New York with, uh, with a, f a few friends of mine. We went to see a Broadway show and, uh, one of my friends was trying to pull into this available parking space in New York, which is major because you just don't usually see parking spaces on the street in New York, but she sees it. She's trying to pull in at the same time someone is trying to back in. So now they're at a stalemate, right? 
my friend is start, you know, nosing in, the other person is backing in and nobody wants to budge. And so one of my other friends is like, "Uh oh, this isn't going to be good. You know, I'm going to go get somebody. And she takes off thinking she's going to find, you know, a, a friendly neighborhood policeman. Um, a couple of minutes later, she comes back, but there's no friendly neighborhood policeman in tow. She comes back with a hotel bellhop. And <laughs> I'm like looking at her and looking at the bellhop and, you know, and he's, he's like, He's like trying to help, you know. And afterwards, I said to her, like, Sharon, why did you go get a bellhop? And she said, well, he had a uniform on. I couldn't find a policeman, but at least he had a uniform. And it's just funny. Like, if you have a uniform, it just conveys something, you know. Fascinating. You know, um, so I'm thinking down to the practical, tactical outside of photographs, right? We talked about, like, um, known industry experts endorsing or organizations endorsing uh, your product or service. We see this a lot of time with books, right? For example, you mentioned Robert Cialdini has endorsed your book, right? So that is an example of the authority principle. You probably have his quote on the cover of your book or on the back of your book, right? So I would imagine these are the kind of things that require a little bit more work for a marketer to achieve um, if we're going to get someone well-known in the industry or an organization to endorse us and it's in copy. Is there other copy principles that don't require us to go out to a known authority or is this mostly about people that are known inside the industry as far as the authority principle goes? You know, there, there are a couple of other things that, that you can do. Um, imagine you're a startup, for example. So, you know, maybe, uh, you know, you're, you're, your name isn't a household name. You're not an authority. I mean, if you've been around for 150 years, that's, you know, in and of itself, that's a mark of authority, right? But if you're a startup, um, you know, you're not going to be able to point to longevity and, uh, and you don't have a, you know, well-established name. And so people aren't, you know, endorsing you or featuring you in Fortune or Fast Company or whatever. Um, but maybe your founders, used to work at Apple or Microsoft ah, or something, you know, like so, or maybe you went to Wharton or Harvard or Yale or, you know, so there are other ways that we can point to authority. The other thing that we can think about is establishing ourselves as, um, as experts or as authorities. And uh, one way to do that is by the content that we produce. So um, imagine uh, you're a conversion optimization agency and you've, uh, publish the 110 point e-commerce checklist. And there in fact is an agency that's done that. And mm -hmm. so you're looking at all the various ones. It's, it's Brian Massey's agency, actually conversion scientist, but um, you're, you know, you're looking at all the available options you have here, you know, at, at your disposal. And then you find the one that's published a 110 point e-commerce checklist. And you think, wow, they must be the authorities, right? I mean, if they're the ones who came up with a 110 point checklist, they must know their stuff. I'm going to go with them. So, you know, the lesson for us, you know, uh, as marketers or as, as business owners is, you know, create the content that makes you appear to be the expert that, you know, that people will look at and go, oh my gosh, uh, you know, they, they have a 110 point checklist. They have a, you know, a, a three page, uh, you know, guide that covers every available, uh, you know, angle when you're trying to make a decision about this particular subject or, or that particular topic, you know, and things like that start to establish your credibility, start to establish your authority. Um, Love and, it. And make you a, a subject matter expert. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Let's talk about the next principle. Uh, first of all, really awesome stuff on the authority principle. We've got two more folks. So what is the next principle? So I, the next one that, uh, that could be fun to talk about um, is one that I came to relatively recently when I was writing the book, I, I took a deep dive into it and I found some really interesting things that, that really surprised me. And it's called the autonomy bias or autonomy bias. And it's basically this deep seated desire that all humans have to exercise some control over themselves and their environment. So as, as people, we do not like to be forced into things. We don't like to be told what to do. We like to have some kind of control. We like to have some kind of agency. And uh, there's some interesting research that's gone into this. There was one study that was done at a retirement home, right? A home for uh, for the aged. And there was a control group and a test group. So the control group was, was the, the residents that, you know, were treated the way they typically been treated. They were given a, a movie to watch every night. They were put, they were given a plant there, you know, plant was put in their room that they could grow. So everyone's got a plant. Everyone is given a movie to watch every night. But then there's a test group. And the test group was allowed to choose from a couple of different movies which movie they wanted to watch every night. And they were allowed to choose which plant they wanted to have in their, in their room, growing in the room. 18 months later, the researchers found that twice as many people 
in the control group had died. So the people who didn't have a choice of the movie, who didn't have a choice of plant. And those are, when you say about it, Michael, those are small choices, right? I mean, everyone got to watch a movie. Everyone had a plant, but they, you know, they could choose which of the, the couple of movies or which particular plant. And yet, you know, and, and the research is kind of controlled for, you know, age and, and health conditions and, and illness. But they pointed to the fact that the test group actually had some autonomy. And, uh, and, and that was, you know, what they believe kind of gave them the, you know, the, the impetus to keep going. So we have this very deep seated desire to, you know, to exert some kind of control over ourselves and our environment. Um, there was a, there was another example. I'm, I'm going to circle back to crosswalks again, interestingly enough, but this one doesn't involve jaywalking, but there were some uh, behavioral scientists from Israel who were visiting New York and, um, they just happened to observe that uh, something interesting happened when people approached a crosswalk. So in New York, what they had done is they decided to disable the, um, the, the buttons that you push when you go to a crosswalk. Usually you get to a crosswalk, there's a button, you push the button, and the, that makes the, the walk sign come on. And they decided, you know what, we're just going to automate it. So every so many minutes, the walk sign would just automatically come on. So they start removing the buttons, and it gets very expensive, and they get about halfway through, and they say, forget it, we're just going to disable the rest of them. So now you're in the situation where some crosswalks have a button. It doesn't work, but the button is there, and other crosswalks don't have a button. And what the behavioral scientist observed was when people would approach a crosswalk with a button and they would press the button, they'd be more likely to wait until the walk sign appeared because they, you know, they had some control over the situation, even though the button wasn't working, they didn't know that they felt that they had control. And as a result, they'd be more willing to wait. Whereas when people approached the crosswalk and there was no button to push, they were more likely to just look left and right and dart across the street. You know, so the idea is if you feel like you have some kind of control, it impacts your behavior and a great way to make our customers and prospects feel like they have some kind of control is to offer them a choice. Mm. Because by definition, if you have a choice, right, if you, if you put one thing down in front of someone, you know, people, well, there, there's no context, there's nothing to compare it to. So what do they do? They say, well, I'm going to do some research, or I'll, I'll talk to my spouse, or I'll, I'll talk to my friends, and life intervenes. And you don't get around to doing the, the Google research or, or talking to your spouse or your friends, and, and the buying moment disappears. But if you put two things in front of people, the question goes from, do I or do I not want this thing, to, ooh, which of these two do I want? And it's almost like a foregone conclusion. You're going to choose one of them. It's just a question of which one. And some research came out of Tulane University that found you can nearly quadruple the likelihood that someone will make a buying decision in the moment if you give them a choice, if you give them more than a single option, which is really very interesting, you know. Um, and, and when I say this, you might say, well, well, don't give them two, give them 10. But then you know, analysis paralysis sets in, you know, everyone's like loving all their mm. options, but they, they can't decide which one to choose. And so they don't choose or they do choose, but they keep wondering if they made the right choice. So, you know, two is better than one, three is good. I wouldn't go any, any further than five, but two or three options instead of one can really increase the likelihood someone will make that buying decision in the moment. And when you think about it, that's what we're after, right? We're in marketing at, at the end of the day that the bottom line is sales basically. So um, I think that's, that's a really interesting and easy uh, tactic that that we can use as marketers just provide that choice. You know, it's interesting because there are a couple different scenarios I can think about. Back in the day, I used to work for this company called Sears, and uh, I worked in the garden department. And people would walk in, and there would be this plethora of different hoses you could buy, and it took me to like dissect to people all the different choices because they were overwhelmed with choices. Like, believe it or not, a hose is just something that moves water, right? Like, why do we need so many choices? But um, for, for our conference, social media marketing world, you know, we eventually introduced choices in the beginning. It was just one ticket. And then we introduced a marketer ticket, which was a lower cost ticket. Then we introduced a virtual ticket. Then we split the virtual ticket into uh, streaming and on demand. So now we have all access marketer streaming and on demand. And um, we have a little checklist, right? So we, in a grid. So we make it easy for people to see like why one is worth hundreds of dollars more than the other one. And in the olden days, you know, we would wait to release each of these products, but eventually we realized we should release all of them at once because if someone um, cannot buy one of the products, they may never come back, right? So, so now we have this grid and we have, you know, I guess it's called price anchoring. Is this really what we're talking about here a little bit? Is, is This is kind of price anchoring, right? When we give people a choice, are you familiar with this concept of price anchoring? I, I am familiar with it. And, and when prices are involved, yes, uh, definitely there's there's anchoring. And, uh, you know, typically what works best is to lead with your most expensive price. That right. becomes the anchor or the reference point. And then, you know, some people will bite and say, oh, it seems like a good value. Other people might say, oh, it's a little too much, a little more than I want to spend. But then everything else beneath it looks like 
a much better buy. Whereas if you start with your cheapest one, which a lot of marketers are tempted to do because you don't want to frighten people away. So let's show them how inexpensive they can get in and you know, then we'll upsell from there. Well, the problem is once you're anchored on that low price, everything seems that much more expensive. No one wants to go there. So um, so absolutely, yeah, starting with that anchor and um, and then providing the options is a really smart thing to do. I've also seen agencies and consultancies where they'll have this basic package, which is exactly what you wanted, you know, when they originally spoke to you. And then they'll have this premium package, which costs X thousands of dollars more, right? And what they're trying to do is say, here's some stuff that you didn't want. And then maybe even here's here's a scaled down kind of package. Can this work for services as well as physical products? Yeah, yeah. I, I think um, th- I think what you're talking about is something called decoy pricing, where uh, you introduce a third option in order to increase the sales of the thing that you really want to sell. So, um, you know, you might have a, if you have a basic and a deluxe, for example, mm. um, you know, or, or a, uh, I don't know, I call it a, a, sil- a, a, a silver and a gold level of service, right? Um, you know, so some people may go with the basic, you know, maybe more people will go to basic, it's a little bit more affordable, or maybe more people will go with the silver, it's a little bit more affordable. But if once you introduce that third option, so you've got, you know, basic deluxe and super deluxe, or you've got silver, gold and platinum, what you do is you you can um, make the platinum so rich that people are like, mm. but instead they say, well, I'm going to go to that middle option, you know, uh, or what you can do is you can make that middle option to be just a little bit less expensive than that most expensive option. And then people look at it and it's the middle option that's the decoy. And it's like, gee, for a couple of bucks more, I can get all of the stuff in the That's exactly what we do with our all access ticket. The Delta is very small. And the idea is like for just two or $300 more, you get so much more, right? And we sell the most expensive product uh, like 85% of the time. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, people look at it and it's like, you know, like, well, why wouldn't I spend just a few bucks more? Like, it's almost crazy not to, you know, when right, I can get right. all of this for just a little bit more. It, it makes perfect sense. I can tell you've had Cialdini on a couple of times. You're like really plugged into this. <laughs> um, just out of curiosity, uh, when it comes to this autonomy bias, what about different pricing models? So let's say I see this with software companies, right? Where they have a monthly versus an annual. Is this is this also something that can give people autonomy where typically the monthly is more expensive and the annual is cheaper, but if you buy the annual, obviously you're committing to a higher upfront cost. Is this also something that fits into this autonomy bias or is this something totally different? Well, it's, um, you know, autonomy is really about having choices. And so in that respect, yes, it's like, hey, you can choose the monthly or you can choose the annual. So you, you've got that choice, which is great. Um, and as a matter of fact, uh, a wonderful thing to do when you're teeing up the choice is to use the BYAF technique, which is, uh, but you are free. So you kind of describe what it is you're offering. You ask people to make the purchase and then you follow it up with, but you are free or but, you know, the choice is yours, but it's up to you, but, you know, you decide. Um, And just reminding people that they're the ones who are in charge, you know, and that that the two options are there for their taking increases uh, almost uh, two, I think it doubles the likelihood that people will do what you want them to do. Um, And then the other thing that you're you're, um, starting to get into is just the idea of, of pricing strategy. And often the smaller the price, the, you know, uh, the more attractive it is. So something could be $365 for the year, or you could say it's only a dollar a day. It's the same price, but a dollar a day just seems so much more affordable, right? Um, in other cases, marketers will choose, a, 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 will, will choose to um, charge a premium if you're going to, you know, do the monthly as opposed to the annual. But Still, we look at the monthly and just the in the aggregate, that number, that monthly number is smaller. And we don't even sometimes do the math and realize, oh, wait a minute, but if I multiply that by 12, I'm paying more than if I just did the annual fee. You know, we just kind of get anchored on that smaller number and say, oh, yeah, that's that's affordable. So there's there's some really interesting pricing uh, psychology that goes on and, uh, you know, trying to um, to make your price look as uh, attractive and, and as small and as affordable as possible it is it's not that difficult to do and it can be really beneficial. Excellent. Okay. So we really dug in deep on this autonomy bias concept. Um, what is your next principle? Uh, okay. So we have, um, I think we have one more that we're going to talk about. And uh, I think the one that we decided on was something called cognitive fluency. And cognitive fluency, Michael, is a mouthful of a phrase that really just means that people prefer things that are easier to think about and, uh, and, and, and you know, things that are easier to understand and things that are easier to think about, right? And so why behavioral scientists 
came up with cognitive fluency, this multisyllabic, you know, phrase. Why do they just call it like the easy to think about principle? But but the truth is, uh, people prefer things that are easier to think about and easier to understand. Not only do they prefer them, they judge them to be more truthful, more accurate, and as a result, they're more persuasive, right? They're more believable, and they feel more confident in their ability to make a decision about them. And that is marketing gold because. At the end of the day, we need people to feel confident because if they don't feel confident, they're not going to make that buying decision. They're going to delay it or they're going to go elsewhere. And neither of those are, are going to be good for us. So we want people to feel confident. So what we want to do is we want to make sure that our marketing messages are easy to understand. And there are two halves to that. One half is the, the language, the words that we use, and, and the other half is the the design and the imagery that we use. So from a, a copy perspective, from a word perspective, we want to use simple language. We want to be very careful about acronyms and jargon and text speak and, you know, long run on sentences. Uh, you know, we just want to use very simple language. And, and sometimes, you know, marketers think, well, you know, that's fine for marketers who are selling beer or donuts, you know, uh, but I have a sophisticated audience. I'm, a, I'm in B2B or I'm selling, you know, uh, computers, high tech or, you know, uh, you know, my, my audience expects me to, to use big words, expects me to, you know, to, to have a certain level. And the truth is there's, there's been research that shows that that's not the case. There was one study that was done with, um, it was abstracts of uh, PhD dissertations. And the researchers went in and they took any word that was nine letters and longer and they replaced it with a shorter synonym. And then they ran this test where some people read the original with the big words and other people read the uh, the altered text that you know meant the same thing but had the smaller synonyms. Not only did people prefer that second version, the one that was easier to read, they judged the authors to be more intelligent, to be smarter, to be more educated. You know, so sometimes we think, oh, it's going to reflect poorly on me if I use simple language, you know, poorly on me as, as the marketer or poorly on our brand. And it's not the case. You know, people prefer it. It, you know, it, it makes life easier for them. They Maybe they could understand more complicated language, but this way they don't have to. And, and humans are, you know, all about saving mental energy. We're all about taking the easy way out. So, so again, one half of this is just making sure that our language is simple. Um, and there was a study that came out of um, Princeton, and it involved stock prices, uh, not stock prices, I'm sorry, stock names. And what they found was stock names that were easier to pronounce outperformed in the market stocks with names that were harder to pronounce. So again, it goes to cognitive fluency, and that's a kind of a dollars and cents case for cognitive fluency. You know, like if we think, oh, what difference does it make if it's easier to pronounce something? You know, in this case, the stock, it actually did better. So, you know, easier, easier to read, easier when to pronounce. When you say stock, do you mean the stock market? Is that what you're yes. talking about? Yes, okay. yes, yes. Okay, yeah, so you're talking about the acronyms that people have decided for like Microsoft is an MSFT or whatever and Google is G-O-O-G-L. Is that what we're talking about? Those little Yes, short yes. And, and so some of them like, you know, G-O-O-G-L or something is, is going to be easier to pronounce than if you had, you know, X M Z T P F right. or something, you know. Um, right. And they, these... Uh, um, Princeton researchers ran the study and then they, you know, they look back and they said, you know, not only did the stock outperform, but it held for several months too. It wasn't just like a flash in the pan thing when it was first offered, but they began to track it. So, um, so this idea of cognitive fluency is, is really quite important. And then the, the other side of it is um, the look of things. We want things to, to look inviting. So we don't want to have really thick paragraphs, you know, long run on sentences. We don't want to, you know, fill all the white space. What, what we do want is we want some white space. We want some breathing room. We want shorter sentences. We want to, you know, invite people in. Uh, we also want to use fonts, typefaces that are more familiar. There was a study that was done where people read a, um, and read about an exercise routine and they either read about it in a very common, you know, uh, Easy, easy to read typeface, Arial maybe or something. Uh, and then they also, other people read about it in a much more ornate typeface. I think it was called brushy. And then, you know, so people read the, you know, the exercise routine and then they were asked, how long do you think it will take to actually do the exercise? Well, the people who read about it in the easier to read typeface estimated, yeah, take about eight minutes. The people who read about it in the more difficult to read typeface said, I don't know, so an exercise like that, probably about 12 minutes. So it, if it's hard to read, we as people just assume it's going to be hard to do. And that's why we have to be very careful. So uh, reverse type, which is, you know, white type knocked out of a, a dark background, it's fine for 
emphasis. It's fine for small, you know, pieces of copy. But if you're going to do paragraph upon paragraph upon paragraph, it can cut your readership by about 50%. And that's not necessarily a good thing to do. Same thing with italicized type. It's just not as easy to read. Uh, I came across an ad once. It was white italicized type on a navy blue background. And they were talking about how easy their product was to use. And I thought, oh my God, this is such a miss because they're saying one thing, but they're really communicating something very different. You know, it's hard to read and you're, you're reading that it's easy, but you're having a hard time reading it. And what it's telling your brain is it's not going to be so easy to, to use this product. So we have to be careful about not only the words we use, but, you know, but what our our layouts look like, what our designs look like, because we, we just want to make it easy for people to consume information. We want them to, uh, well, they will take the path of least resistance, and we want that path of least resistance to lead exactly to the action we want them to take. As someone who's been a copywriter most of my life, I can um, I can give a double thumbs up to what you just said, specifically with white space, right? Um, a lot of the emails we send that are promotional in nature, they have one sentence paragraphs, right? And very short sentences. And they're written in um, in a casual tone in the same way that I would speak. You know what I mean? Not written in like a very formal tone. And I tell my team, never use acronyms unless you're absolutely 100%. Everybody knows what it is like ROI. You know, that's one of the rare ones we let people use. But um, it is crazy how much of a difference um, it is. Because if the brain... Look, we have choices, right? Everybody has a lot of choices. They can scroll through their uh, social platforms and ignore your ads or your organic posts. They can scroll through their emails and ignore your emails. But if you make it easy on the brain, right, which is this cognitive fluency, you're going to increase the likelihood that that message is going to go through those eyeballs into the cortex, whatever, right, to, to, to get the persuasive action that we want, right? And it seems obvious, but it's not obvious, is it? No, no, you're absolutely right. You know, sometimes we think um, if we can just get the information out there and it's accurate and there are no typos and we, you know, we made the, you know, the, the media deadline or, or, or the, you know, the, you know, the content, you know, calendar deadline, we're good. We're golden, right? We've, we've checked it off the list. We've said something that was accurate. We've got it out there on time and it's good. But the truth is the difference between one word and another can, can be huge, you know, um, Jay Schwedelson, uh runs uh, Outcome Media, and and uh, as part of that, he runs SubjectLine.com, and, and so he does a bunch of different tests, and he found that if you use the word free in a subject line, as opposed to the word complimentary, you mm -hmm. get a 50% increase in your opening rate. Now, think about it. Free and complimentary, they mean the same thing, and, and one could even argue that complimentary sounds a little bit nicer, a little bit uh you know, more refined, but, you know, not only is free going to take fewer characters from your subject line, it's going to get you double the opens, you know, so it's, it's little things like that. And speaking of little things, there was a, there was a test that was run where there was an e-commerce company and they were introducing a shipping fee. And whenever you tell, you know, your, your company, okay, we're going to start charging for shipping. Everyone just kind of dies a little inside because you know that people aren't going to like that. But uh, this this company decided, well, we can call it a five dollar fee or we can call it a small five dollar fee. And, you know, on the surface, Michael, we all know what five dollars is. Right. We know how much five dollars is worth. We, we know it's not a huge sum. But yet adding the word small got them a 20 percent increase in sales. So wow. it's, it's these little things. The, the word choice can make a big difference and it's worth taking the time to to think about it you know and and to deliberately choose your words not only so that they're uh you know shorter and easy to understand not only so that your message is more succinct um not only so that it's, it's more casual and friendly but also because you know very deliberately one different word can really pay off in terms of your open rate in terms of your response rate um and then as you were saying earlier just in terms of of people understanding and remembering you know um concrete language is another good uh, another example of that there was a study that found that uh emails that use more concrete language for an e-commerce site resulted in a 30 percent lift in sales and when i say more concrete language the difference was i think uh instead of saying pants they said blue jeans right but just mm -hmm. using something that's a little bit more specific you know instead of saying it it'll it's going out you know this week saying you know it'll be at your doorstep by the end of the week you know where you can create a mental picture and that literally translated to more sales so so being deliberate about our word choice, thinking about it uh, really can make a big difference. It can be a big advantage for us. And it's an easy, inexpensive advantage to acquire. Nancy Harhut, author of Using Behavioral Science in Marketing, thank you for 
answering my litany of questions in a very clear, concise way so that my cognitive brain could get a lot of fluency. Now, if people want to um, connect with you um, or reach out to you uh, in whatever way, what's the best way for them to get to you? Uh, sure. I mean, they can find me on um, on LinkedIn and Facebook and Twitter slash X. And I would love to hear from any of your listeners. Uh, you can also uh, get in touch with me at my agency, HBT Marketing, hbtmktg.com. We kind of abbreviate marketing to MKTG. Um, but I'd love to hear from anybody. I'd love to connect with anybody. Um, love to continue the conversation. Um, beyond the podcast, but, uh, but thank you very much for that opportunity. And of course, my book is available uh, wherever fine books are sold, Using Behavioral Science and Marketing, published by Kogan Page. It's at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Kogan Page. And you can find lots and lots of actionable, practical tips about using behavioral science in marketing to increase engagement and response in that book. Is it safe to assume you're the only Nancy Harhut that they're going to find on the various social platforms, or is there more than one if they were to search for you? I think there's only me. Okay. Outstanding. <laughs> that is good marketing. Nancy, thank you so much for sharing your insights with us. We're so much better because of it. Thank you so much. It's, it's really been a joy talking to you and I really appreciate this opportunity.